England's international cricketing year is soon to get underway with a series against Pakistan in Dubai. And the Test Match special team will, of course, be there to describe every moment of it. Over the decades, many commentators have been loved and admired, but none was as revered as John Arlott, who died just over 20 years ago. It was a loss deemed significant enough to be a major item on that evening's television news. John Arlott, whose distinctive cricket commentaries for the BBC earned him the respect and affection of millions, has died at his home in the Channel Islands. He was 77 and had been ill for some time. For those who love the game, Arlott was simply the voice of cricket. And for those indifferent to the sport, he was still somehow the voice of an English summer. There was the tone of the voice, mellowed by the good red wine he knew so much about. There was the accent of his native Hampshire that he neither lost nor compromised. But above all, there was a poet's reverence for words and the cadence of their delivery. There falls across this one December day the light remembered from those sons of June that you reflected in the summer play of perfect strokes across the afternoon. No yeoman ever walked his household land more sure of step or more secure of lease than you, accustomed and unhurried. That's John Arlott in 1981, reading a poem he'd written years previously to mark the 70th birthday of the cricketer he admired more than any other, Jack Hobbs. Arlott said time and time again that cricket's greatness as a sport was most importantly a human one, that it revealed the character of its players like no other. And the secret of his genius as a commentator was his ability to produce a metaphor that suddenly gave the listener a new insight into a particular cricketer. He had one fast bowler running in as though he's madly peddling an invisible bicycle. He had another coming into bowl like Groucho Marx chasing after a waitress. But when the moment came at Lord's in September 1980 for him to give his very last Test Match commentary, he signed off as a true professional. Nothing flowery, just the facts. Right again, going round the wicket to the right-handed Boycott, and Boycott pushes this away between silly point and slip. It's picked up by Mallet at short third man, and that's the end of the over at 69 for two. Nine runs off the over, 28 Boycott, 15 Gower, 69 for two, and after Trevor Bailey, it will be Christopher Martin Jenkins. The match was a special centenary meeting between England and Australia. And when it was announced over the public address system that John Arlott had just finished his last commentary, everyone in the ground, both spectators and players, turned to the commentary box and clapped. It had been known for some time, of course, that Arlott would be retiring, and there was a last concerted effort by the media to try and understand what his secret as a commentator was. Cricket is a game which, perhaps because of its slow-moving character, has evolved what I've always regarded as a unique form of journalism the ball-by-ball radio commentary. It's the one area which it seems to me uh, leaves radio as unmistakably the king. That's Simon Jenkins introducing an edition of the television programme The Editors, which was broadcast in August 1980, and which was dedicated to what he called the art of ball-by-ball commentary. Not that John Arlott bought into that description of what he did. It's not a unique art form any more than the reporting of bullfighting is. Nothing in cricket to compare with Goya. Don't, for heaven's sake, think that I think commentators are the be-all and end-all of the game. I don't. I'm just watching and saying what they think about it. I only think I can say what I see. Arlott had also been asked to sum up the secret of good commentary when he was interviewed by Helen Bamber on Woman's Hour in June 1968. She suggested that he had to fall back on picture painting when nothing was happening in the cricket itself. But this was not a situation that John Arlott recognised. But something is happening, you see. If the cat has come out of the tavern, or the pigeons are on the pitch behind the stumps, this is, in fact, to my mind, what commentary is made of. It's telling people what you see, trying to take it in through the eyes and get it out through the lips. And if the play itself is not exciting, it doesn't mean that nothing's happening. Uh, For instance... Now, at this moment, one might be watching the cricket, but would also talk about the gulls screeching outside and things like this and wonder if this means there's going to be a change in the weather. And one doesn't invent things about cricket commentary because you don't need to invent them. One tries to talk interestingly as if one were 
talking to a friend who couldn't see or who wasn't there and you were talking over the telephone to them. Got to be an act of communication. Helen Bamber ended the interview with a question to which she presumed she already knew the answer. And I suspect it might well be a brief answer if I to say, were to say what pleases you most in life. I am anticipating, I suppose, well, but maybe... My home isn't. life. Your home life? Yeah. This is why I never go on overseas cricket tours now, because I wouldn't leave home. Could you define that a bit more clearly? I had anticipated cricket, of course, but... I oh, know, I've got an extremely pleasant house that occupies my mind and activities all the time I'm around it, in exactly the sort of town I would want to live in, in the only county I would really want to live in, and a wife and two children with whom I'm completely happy, and this for me will do for the rest of life. John Arlott was an admirer of the great Trinidadian cricket writer and political activist C.L.R. James. And it was James who famously posed the question, what do they know of cricket who only cricket know? One can adapt it to pose another one. What do they know of John Arlott who only his commentary know? <laughs> <laughs> Would the team strike if the BBC refused to raise their fees? Uh, what, from ninepence to tenpence, would it be? Uh... As far as I'm concerned, the BBC's been refusing to increase fees for years and years. <laughs> Actually, you go on working for the BBC, not really because of the fees, because it's become a habit. And actually, if they stop booking you, you don't know what to do. You sort of twiddle your thumbs on a Friday night or all during the cricket season. So I more or less hang around in the hope that they will one day be charitable. That's John Arlott appearing on Any Questions in March 1957 with Freddie Griswood as the presenter. The programme had yet to become dominated by party political argument and Arlott was a regular panellist. So was Arthur Street, who gave a serious answer to the question before Arlott again lightened the mood. The BBC has a monopoly on sound, not on TV. And the difference is extraordinary. Because in television there is competition. In sound there is no competition. And the attitude, I don't say it's said, but it's implied by the BBC on sound. If you don't broadcast for us, ha ha ha, you won't broadcast for anybody. <laughs> And there is more exploitation by the BBC on sound than the most grasping employer in Britain has ever tried to do. <laughs> John, come in. <clears throat> well, uh, if we get down to historic facts, Freddie and I were present on the occasion when we two and Arthur took this programme on television. And the reason that Arthur now works in sound and not on television is that after he had been made up, he looked at himself in the mirror <laughs> and decided that it wasn't worth the money. <laughs> A month later, John Arlott was once again on the panel and was able to show the natural and spontaneous wit that made him such a compelling broadcaster. Would the team please comment on the recent criticism of modern double beds which dip in the middle made at a meeting of the British Medical Association? John Arnold? Mm. Oh, this is very simple. When I was first married, we had a double bed and it didn't dip in the middle. <laughs> we have since put on two stone a piece and now it dips in the middle, but I'm disinclined to blame the bed. <laughs> Then, Freddie Griswood's Any Questions showed its unique ability to move seamlessly from frivolity to deep seriousness. The middle and late 1950s were fearful times, with the nuclear arms race between the USA and the Soviet Union seemingly unstoppable. And the panel was asked to assess the prospects for world peace. John Arlott went first. I'm almost embarrassed to be faced with this question in a programme which is supposed to have an entertainment quality. This is, if I may be forgiven for advertising American commercial television, the $64,000 question, because it is the question of life or death. There are two great powers in this world, America and Russia. 
forget us for a bit, we haven't the firepower to rank up with them. Now, I don't think either of these two wants the war, which all the world recognises is going to be the end of creation as far as we are concerned. Don't think this is a question of Russia winning a war or America winning a war. If they start to drop this poison they're testing out now, it's the end of the lot of us. I would like to be able to trust the Russians. I don't. I don't trust the Americans much. I would be far more inclined to trust the Russians if their unpaid agents in this country would stop trying to poison the trade unions and ruin our economy and our production. Let them lay off and say, all right, you are not our enemies, we are not trying to destroy you underground. And then please, 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 let the powers of this world get together and try to discuss not destroying the world. And let us therefore try not to be too biased by the fact that every time America or Russia proposes a peace settlement, she proposes a peace settlement which will give her just an edge of advantage if peace shouldn't come out of it. If only they would talk about peace and not peace with an advantage to them. There are many clues in this to John Arlott's politics. He was a liberal with both a small and a capital L and he stood twice, both times unsuccessfully, as a parliamentary candidate for the Liberal Party. He was as adamant in his rejection of any ideological commitment to the American way as he was of any to Soviet communism. And, as the conclusion to his answer in April 1957 on world peace showed, he had a passionate attachment to a sense of Britain as the home of a humane and critical tradition of radicalism. And do let me say that I believe Britain, if she would go back to some of her radical principles of the last century, might be the mediating influence in creating that peace, because we, at least for a time, had a reputation for moral integrity in international affairs, and by heaven, if ever we needed it, we need it now. Throughout his life, John Arlott was a deeply and passionately political person. He had a hatred of discrimination, especially on grounds of race, and of inherited influence and the power of private wealth. All that put him on the left, but his deepest attachments were to the individual and the community in which that individual lived, so he had no time for what he saw as the collectivist and bullying tendencies of socialism, and his liberalism meant he could stand outside and scorn the great fault line of British politics, that between Tory and Labour. It's probably a good thing he never became an MP, he would have regarded a three-line whip as a provocation. He hears in any questions, again from 1957, on the subject of local democracy. The thing that drives so many people away from local politics is that they think they're just a tag-on to party politics. Of course they're not. Why on earth should local government affairs be settled in the local Conservative Club or the local Labour Club as if they were political matters? Of course they're not. Local government wants handling by people of decent goodwill with a concern for the fundamental welfare of that community, not on a party basis so that half the issues that come up before a council are settled and the minutes could be read in advance before the meeting's ever held. And I'll tell you this, the danger about local politics that have estranged so many people from them is that they're as crooked as the big politics at the top. Why on earth do my local affairs and the availability of ambulances have to be settled on a fiddle in some local meeting so that I never hear the true issues at stake from the bloke who wants to sell them motor vehicles to do the job. Yeah. I give the socialists this credit, at least when they stand for local government, they call themselves socialists. Yeah. The Tories call themselves ratepayers, but they're still the same thing, and so are the socialists. They still use power politics in local politics, so that when an issue comes up, the question is not, is this good for my town, but which side put it up. The last thing one could call John Arlott would be a dissembler. As a cricket commentator, he described things as he saw them. As a political commentator, he said things as he believed them. 
and if his attack on the politicisation of local government seems passionate enough, is nothing compared to his on-air condemnation of trade union restrictive practices. In May 1959, he found himself on an Any Questions panel alongside Victor Feather. At the time, Feather was Assistant Secretary of the TUC and was later to become General Secretary. A dispute that was much in the news at the time was one on Merseyside between boilermakers and shipwrights as to who should carry out a particular task, and the panel was asked if it was bringing discredit on the whole trade union movement. Victor Feather was the first to speak. I don't think that the practices of craft unions as such bring discredit on the trade union movement. But in respect of the particular thing that you're really talking about, that that have been described as the twanging string uh, dispute at Camel Laird Yard at Birkenhead, uh, that is something which uh, does, in fact, bring discredit on the trade union movement unless, unless uh, disputes of that character about demarcation are dealt with through the machinery which does exist for the peaceful settlement of these difficulties. Victor Feather went on to argue that demarcation disputes were unavoidable given that the workers involved had no security of employment. But John Arlott would have none of it. Look, let's acquit Victor Feather as a person on this. He holds yeah. an official op position and he couldn't have said anything else but what he did say. Yeah. And once he said it, he must realise how terribly feeble it is. This is not protecting workers against the employers. This is the boilermakers, because their numbers are bigger, trying to stop the shipwrights from drawing a chalk line on an iron plate. I never heard of such bunkum in my life. These chaps aren't out of work. There it is, good, rich work, right at their fingertips. But it isn't going to stay there long. If they put the people who provide the money for them to do the work out of business by folding up on a job that's due for delivery in June, this is sheer murder. And if the employers had ever done this to the trade unionists, they'd have shrieked their heads off and I'd have been on their side. But this is a new sort of tyranny, and it's a fantastically ignorant sort of tyranny. And whether you fight it through what Victor Feather calls the appropriate machinery, or whether you fight it through what he says has the appearance of a strike, but which is a strike, and which is throwing other men out of work. Whatever you do, it's sheer, utter, absolute and tyrannical nonsense, and it makes me throw up. <laughs> But so equally did what he saw as any doctrinaire commitment to the free market. In October 1959, Any Questions celebrated its 400th edition with a programme from Bristol. Arlott was joined on the panel by the leading Labour intellectual Dick Crossman and the Canadian Ted Leather, who was Conservative MP for the local constituency of Somerset North. It was a generally light-hearted programme, until this question came up. Are the diehards who continue to preach nationalisation to be commended for their perseverance, reproved for their pig-headedness, or just pitied for their foolishness? And I did think we were going to get through one of these sessions without any political things coming in, but still, never mind. Ted Leather was the first to speak, and he commended the questioner. I'm sure Mr Harmersmith is absolutely accurate when he connects the phrase diehards with this, because nationalisation is, of course, a thoroughly old-fashioned creed, it is only held by those who haven't changed their views in 50 years. From my own personal point of view, I, I would neither uh, reprove nor pity them. I would positively encourage them. They make life so much easier for people like me. John Arlott was not impressed by such a glib answer from a leading Tory. I wish I could think this was a reasonable question, but I don't. You see, there's no shibboleth. There's no real answer nationalisation for everything or nationalisation for nothing. You don't want an army on private enterprise, do you? But that's what it used to be. Do you want a profit or do you want a service? Because if you want a service off the railways, you must nationalise them. Otherwise you won't get a train to get from here to Bradford on Avon because it isn't economic. But nobody is right senses says nationalisation is wrong or nationalisation is right. He says how can this be done best for the country? By the country running it or private enterprise running it? But he doesn't swallow every piece of sucker stuff he gets in the right-wing press to say that nationalisation is something evil. 
But this being a celebratory edition, the programme ended on a lighter note. Now we leave this because we have time just for one more from Mrs... Mrs B.J. Baker. B.J. Baker. Why do members of the team take part in this programme? Why do members of the team take part in this programme? Well, let's go through the team. Dick, Dick Crossman, have you answer first. Oh, let's be honest. A, a because we're asked, B, because we enjoy it, and C, I suppose, because we're all sort of people who like being on a platform and making fools of ourselves and making success. We love it. Yeah. That's jolly honest, anyway. John Arlott. I do it for... I do it for fun and money. <laughs> John Arlott was still on the panel eight years later, in November 1967, when he was joined in South Wales by the future Labour leader Michael Foote and by a young Conservative MP called Margaret Thatcher. They met in the shadow of the terrible disaster at Aberfan, where an unsafe slag heap had collapsed and buried the primary school, taking with it the majority of a village generation. Needless to say, the coal industry, both its safety and its future, was uppermost in the minds of the audience in Cardiff that evening and the first questioner asked if the panel thought it right that £3 million of public money be spent on removing all the remaining slag heaps in Aberfan. While agreeing that it should, Michael Foote argued that slag heaps were an unavoidable by-product of coal mining, and that the only way to have none of them was to run down the coal industry. This, though, he said, would create an unacceptable level of unemployment in the Welsh valleys. Then John Arlott gave a deeply characteristic answer, going beyond the economics of the matter to something more human. There are two questions here, really, Mrs Sullivan. Yeah. One is a general question and the other one is yours. Every tip, everywhere, ought to be examined. It ought to be decided whether it is absolutely safe or not, and if it is not absolutely safe, it should be taken away. And by teaching this, Abervan perhaps hasn't suffered in vain. But for the people of Aberfan, I believe whether these tips are threatening or not, they ought to be taken away. Because everybody who suffered in that must look at them every day and feel the whole thing sweep over them again. And this is why three million pounds are not. They ought to be taken away because of what they still do to people in the mind and in the heart, not in physical danger. The fourth member of the panel was the Bishop of Llandaff and Archbishop of Wales, W. Glyn Simon, who, free to do so perhaps by the lack of any party allegiance, hazarded a brave opinion as to the future of the coal industry. Surely, whether we like it or not, coal as a source of fuel on anything like the scale it has been in the past is on the way out, and it is an urgent matter that any government in power should see to it that the... <coughs> way out is cushioned for those who have earned their living in this particular way and now seeing their particular way of living come to an end. I think coal mining is going to disappear and governments should be getting ready for it and not being taken by surprise as they so often are. Then it was Margaret Thatcher to the microphone. She expressed her desire to see a wholesale inspection of all slag heaps and the removal of any deemed to be a risk and she suggested that the necessary monies could be raised by a special national fund. She then turned to what the bishop had said about the coal industry and expressed opinions that seemed somewhat startling, giving her attitude towards it once she became Prime Minister. I don't think coal mining as such is on the way out. Uh, I think it will be reduced in amount, the uneconomic pits will go, but when that's done, one may well see a revival in the use of coal as one saw in America after the initial reorganisation had taken place. John Arlott wasn't interested in what Margaret Thatcher had said about the future need for coal. He latched onto what she had said about the need for American-style reorganisation and for letting uneconomic pits go to the wall. He realised she was talking about privatisation, and he didn't like it. He described coal as... The most efficiently run of all the nationalised industries, which has been planned with infinite care, which has balanced its budget better than any other and has handled its employees, I think, better than any other. The handling of the coal board, to my mind, has been quite superb among these nationalised industries, and I think that it does them a great injustice to, su to suggest that they are on their way completely out. We can't do without them, and we certainly owe a duty to them. 
Finally, the panel was asked a question whose subtext was the character and behaviour of the then Foreign Secretary, George Brown. To what extent should a country's image abroad be reflected in the personality of its foreign minister? <laughs> George Brown, who'd become Harold Wilson's foreign secretary in August 1966, had nothing in common with the traditional social elite of British diplomacy. He'd grown up in poverty in South London, had not been to university, had risen in the Labour Party through the trade union movement and represented a working-class constituency in Derbyshire. None of this could openly be held against him. What could be was his drinking. On more than one occasion, he appeared on television when obviously drunk, and each time the popular right-wing press had a field day. And it had Margaret Thatcher's support that evening in Cardiff. I would say that with a country such as ours, which has a great past and which I believe has a great future, it should have a foreign minister whom we can all respect whether or not we agree with his politics. I do not believe that we can respect and look up to the one we've got now. Uh, I'm all for having strong personalities in politics, but I think it's most important in that particular job that we should have a person who represents the very best in courtesy and dignity as well as personality. George Brown's only difficulty was with drink and its attendant emotionalism. There was never a hint of sexual scandal, and when it was his turn to speak, Michael Foote argued that there had been some very successful foreign secretaries who had had what he called the most appalling private lives, instancing Disraeli and Palmerston in particular. Then it was John Arlott. Let's, if we might, look at the other side. I can remember a foreign minister who I believe had a quite blameless private life in every respect, Sir Samuel Hoare, and he more or less ruined this country. He was an appalling foreign minister. It said that any, gov any country gets the government it deserves, it probably gets the ministers it deserves, and it, they probably reflect their background, their time, and their own country. And if a foreign minister slaps someone on the back and says, what cheer, as they didn't a hundred years ago, it may not do any harm. And the foreign ministers of a hundred years led us into far more wars than we can afford. I'll stick with this chap. I think he's a very important thing that some people forget in politics. He's honest. And I will forgive an honest politician a very great deal. But a smug hypocrite that steers my country into war, I'm a him. This is getting close to the heart of John Arlott's politics. Honesty rather than style, substance rather than appearance, the person rather than his class and background. These were the criteria by which he judged others. He himself had had as little formal education as George Brown and instinctively defended him against the taunts of the establishment. And these, equally, were the criteria that informed his judgments about the world of cricket. Because in the 1950s and 60s, when it came to majority political attitudes, there wasn't all that much difference between the House of Lords in Westminster and Lords Cricket Ground in St John's Wood. They were both bastions of inherited privilege, while John Arlott was the son of a cemetery keeper. Arlott had fallen in love with cricket as a small boy in Basingstoke, and he always identified most closely with the yeomen of the game, not the superstars, and certainly not the administrators, but those often referred to somewhat patronisingly as honest county pros. He knew how insecure their jobs were and how little they were paid, and he admired their commitment and their camaraderie. He also recognised how good they were because he had never excelled as a player himself. You know, I often think of the lady in Oscar Wilde who knew nothing at all about music but was very fond of musicians. And I've always got on very well with cricketers. This was our lot in conversation with Mike Brearley, a former England cricket captain, in one of three hour-long programmes that were made by cheerleader productions for Channel 4 and broadcast in 1984. The programmes were as close as he had then got to providing any sort of autobiography, and the conversations were as riveting as they were revealing. I've always got on very well with cricketers. I think in many ways they're the best community I've ever been in. It's local government, mental hospitals, the police, Fleet Street, the stage, BBC, sound, radio, television, association football, badminton, fishing book collecting, antiquarian books, 
of all the communities I've ever been in, I found cricket and cricketers the most rewarding. I think in many ways, and there's some slight evidence to the contrary in recent years, on the whole, I think they're the most loyal and generous people. There's undoubtedly a romanticism to this view, but John Arlott had no problem in describing himself as a romantic, or at least a sentimentalist. But this romanticism about cricketers led him to adopt hard-headed and often brave political positions in their defence. None more so than what he did to help a young, to him unknown, South African cricketer in the autumn and winter of 1959-60. to I suppose you will be infuriated with me for writing yet another letter to you. Being so very keen to play cricket in the Lancashire League, I just cannot refrain from availing myself of your generosity. I would therefore once again try and appeal to you, Mr. Arlett, to see whether there is any hope of your assisting me. I feel that by playing in England, I would be able to acquire a tremendous amount of experience to hand over to our junior players. Mr. Arlett, I dare say that this is only a minor detail compared, I presume, to all your other escapades, but I am sure that you would try your best and use your powerful influence to assist me. The letter, there had obviously been at least one previously as well, was neatly written in green ink, and it came from an address in Cape Town. It was dated August the 27th, 1959, and it was signed Basil D'Oliveira. On September the 10th, Arlott replied, Many thanks for your letter. I am doing what I can to get your name put around the Lancashire League clubs. If anything can be done, it will be. Given Basil D'Oliveira's subsequent fame, both as a player and as a political symbol, it's hard to think one's way back to a point where John Arlott, one of the best known and one of the busiest men in English cricket, decided, seemingly without any hesitation, to try and help a coloured South African cricketer whom he'd never met and never seen play. In early January 1960, another letter in green ink arrived from Cape Town. It began with formal Christmas and New Year greetings, and then went on... Mr Arlett, I suppose you know what this letter is all about. But being very anxious, I am once again worrying you for information about the Lancashire League. Have you any further news? Mr Arlott replied by return. Thank you for your note. I only wish I had more news for you. But I have written to Lancashire again, and I do solemnly promise that the instant I hear anything, I will write to you. I know how keen you are, and I wish I could do more. His letter crossed with one from Benny Bansda, a coloured Cape Town sports writer who was one of Dolivera's closest friends. Being one of your most ardent fans, I feel that if anyone could help Basil, it could only be you, for you are renowned in the cricket world, and being one of the finest critics in the game, you have the means of saying just what is desired. I beg and implore you to see what could be done for one of our most talented sportsmen in South Africa. Basil Oliveira had achieved extraordinary things within the narrow confines of non-white cricket in South Africa. But apartheid meant he was condemned always to play on inferior pitches and to never have access to the sort of coaching available to the best white players. He was desperate to get to England, and in his 1980 autobiography he explains with honest simplicity why he tried to get John Arlott's help. English cricket and John Arlott had always been synonymous to me, he wrote. I read everything I could find about the English Test and County players and hung on every word of Mr Arlott whenever I heard his radio commentaries in Cape Town. His voice and the words he spoke convinced me that he was a nice, compassionate man. John Arlott himself had no idea what sort of man Basil D'Oliveira was. He had no need to. All that mattered to him was that here was a non-white South African who was obviously passionate about cricket and who wanted a chance to play it somewhere where there was no racial discrimination. The roots of Arlott's fierce opposition to apartheid lay in his one visit to South Africa as a commentator in the winter of 1948-9. Towards the end of 1981, he was a special guest on the Michael Parkinson show and he told his host about how the trip had ended. I was given this awful form, you know, when I went to get on the plane and it wanted my name and address and then it said race. Now, in brackets after that, where you had to fill it in, it said South African or other European, African, Indian or other Asiatic. So I wrote human. <laughs> and this Afrikaans emigration, obviously, what's that mean? So I said, that's the race I belong to, the human race. Ever heard of it? 
That's not what we want, he says. Yeah, you see what we want, he says. He says I don't care what you want. You've got what I am. I'm a human. And all of a sudden, it went a bit cold. I thought, God, I'm not out of this country yet. <laughs> now, what's he going to do to me? Because they were capable of most things. And we looked into one another's eyes, and I don't think he saw how frightened I was, and he said, Yes, you're not playing, mon. I got on the plane. I've never been back since. I wouldn't go back again. So it's hardly surprising that John Arlott responded immediately to Basil D'Oliveira's plea for help. In mid-January 1960, he contacted an old friend, John Kay, who worked for the Manchester Evening News, and whose brother Edwin was secretary of the Central Lancashire League. I feel that if he could get an appointment here, it might be a great thing for non-white sport in South Africa. While I think he would do a good job as a pro, I think asking him here might change the sporting, and to some extent the political face of South Africa, which seems to me to be very worthwhile. I would not give a tuppenny damn if he were just an ordinary cricketer in one of the test-playing countries, but this would be such a fine thing to do. The last thing I want out of it is credit, but I would love to see it happen. John Arlott had turned to the right people for help, because on January the 20th he was finally able to send good news to Cape Town. Now, I have an offer for you to play as a professional in England this summer, but it is imperative that you cable me your decision about it at once. It is with Middleton who for the last two summers have won the Central Lancashire League, with Roy Gilchrist, the West Indian fast bowler, as their professional. You will appreciate that it will not be easy to take his place. The demand is for a consistent all-rounder who will hold his catches and, under the captain, act as the strongest link in the side. D'Oliveira was offered a contract for a 20-week season for which he would receive a total of £450. He had to be helped by friends to raise the money for his passage, but his response to our lot was bullish. There is so much at stake for non-white sport in South Africa that I am quite prepared to face anything. I think the whole non-white community will go wild when the news hits the local press this week. My sincerest thanks and appreciation for everything so far. While well, Arlott passed on his own appreciation to Edwin Kay at the Central Lancashire League. I do feel that this could be even bigger than cricket and that in its odd way it might be a considerable contribution to the esteem in which Britain is held in Africa, by Africans. John Arlott was never to see Basil D'Oliveira bat that summer. In damp early season conditions, the South Africans struggled. But then he came good, ending as the highest run scorer in the whole league. And when he got back to Cape Town in the autumn, he was able to write a final triumphant letter to his mentor in England. I received a tremendous, unexpected welcome on my arrival here in Cape Town. The streets were lined with cheering crowds. Naturally, the Bura, I hope you can pronounce this Afrikaans word, Mr. Arlett, were aghast that a darky could get such an ovation. Anyway, this and the opening created now for our coloured cricketers is all due to your efforts, for which I, and all South African non-white cricketers, will always be grateful. Basil D'Oliveira, who died last November after a long illness, was renowned as a modest man. But he knew that once in Lancashire, he was scoring runs on behalf of millions of black and coloured South Africans. And in the very month that he arrived in England, April 1960, the vexed question of what to do about apartheid came up on any questions. John Arlott was at his impassioned best. Freddie, we may be able to play this programme from time to time, almost as a parlour game, but... This is such an important question as I see it and means so much in the minds of so many people in this country even, far away as it is, that I beg your indulgence to, as you might say, perhaps waste a little time on it. I wasted a little time on it in this programme, as you'll remember, ten years ago and I got into very, very hot water for saying exactly what everybody in England is saying now. And now I'd like to go on and say what I very honestly believe about this. I have been in South Africa, and I've been very, very harrowed by what I've seen. Since then, I've been very harrowed by what I've heard. Mr Macmillan said, believing, I fancy, that he was very strong that the wind of change was blowing through South Africa. This is no wind. This is the great, big, strong, certain river of history. Mm. And Dr. Favard isn't going to hold that back with a race card. 
So what will I do if I'm a white man in South Africa? And I've got to think a bit hard about this. I looked at the funny old telly last night <laughs> and they were wondering if assassination was ever right. Could be right. I'd shoot this chap if I didn't think another one had come up in his place and think I'd done well. If I did any good for 10 million black men. But I don't think it would help. See, I could assuage my conscience by going to the police and saying, I reckon the people who are in the majority in this country, their own country, have got to be given a break. Now lock me up. And they would. And they'd knock me senseless with their gun barrels. And that wouldn't do any good. And if I went over to the Africans, they wouldn't have me because my colour is wrong. I reckon what I would come, I would try to do, would be to come to England and reach the Prime Minister and say, this is not a wind, it's a torrent. Recognise it, recognise the right of human beings and have the courage to come out in the United Nations and say, this thing is evil even if it does mean part of my country's stock exchange income through the gold and diamond shares. It's wrong, and because I'm English, I've got the courage to condemn it and hope that when the Africans eventually rule on an ordinary democratic basis of a majority, <laughs> they may remember that there was one white race that thought they were entitled to do it. <laughs> It was to be another 34 years before an ordinary democracy was created in South Africa and that the white minority eventually conceded defeat was much to do with the fact that for the best part of two decades before 1994, the rest of the world refused to have anything to do with South African sports teams that were selected on a racial basis. The international success of their rugby union 15, or to a lesser extent their cricket 11, was central to how white South Africans saw their position in the world. The sporting boycott hurt, and in terms of cricket, its starting place was England in the spring of 1970. April is always an important month for cricket lovers as a new season beckons, but in 1970, anticipation was mixed with trepidation, as the tourists due in England that summer were the all-white South Africans, and a movement grew up to either stop them coming or to disrupt their games if they did. I think John Arlott's particular bravery was was that he was running against the, the grain of the overwhelming opinion in the cricket world, which was either actively sympathetic to the South Africans, uh, not understanding that racist cricket was unacceptable and simply seeing it in uh, traditional cricketing terms, or alternatively indifferent. Whereas for John Arlott, this was a matter of fundamental principle for him. He was... Outraged. Peter Hayne is the MP for Neath and a senior figure in the Labour Party. In 1970, aged just 20, having arrived in England four years previously from South Africa where he had grown up, he became chairman of the Stop the 70 Tour Committee. During the winter of 69 to 70, their campaign had successfully disrupted matches played by the all white South African rugby team, and as spring arrived, they turned their attention to cricket. Their plans were for direct, non-violent action, if necessary, for invading the pitch and making cricket impossible. It was a political intervention that seemed almost unimaginable in the staid, still class-ridden world of English cricket. Yet the young Peter Hayne found a staunch ally in the 56-year-old John Arlott. I found John very easy to relate to politically. He was somebody of my kind of instincts, probably more moderate than me, I was uh, a militant, young liberal activist, a socialist from my youth, and John was more of a, a principled, liberal, civilised, uh, rounded man. But I think our fundamental values, the sense of uh, strong, un, you know, uncompromising uh, belief in fairness, in human rights, in justice and a detestation of racism in all its forms was something that we shared very much in common. John was always on the side of the common person and of 
justice for everybody. He was an anti-establishment figure who could move easily within the establishment because he was so good at what he did and so authoritative that he was able to kind of span both his radical instincts and people who identified with those and then also cricket lovers whatever their their politics who respected him for what he was the finest cricket commentator in my view of his age and he never once criticized us even though many who were maybe sympathetic to the anti-apartheid cause were vigorous in their criticisms of the militancy of non-violent direct action physically interrupting matches or threatening to do so in the case of that cricket tour which we finally stopped John Arlott never criticised us at all, and I'll always uh, be grateful to him for, for that and for many other things. The political solidarity between Peter Hain and John Arlott was brought home to a wide audience in April 1970, when they both took part in a panorama debate on BBC One television. Tension over the campaign to stop the cricket tour was exacerbated by the fact that a general election which was to see the Tories under Edward Heath score an unexpected victory over Harold Wilson's ruling Labour Party, was only months away, and there was scaremongering in the popular press about mob rule. Panorama brought together four men who had no doubt the tour should go ahead, and four who were as adamantly opposed to it. The pros were a representative cross-section of the cricketing establishment, including Wilf Wooler, the combative chairman of Glamorgan, Morris Allam, the president of the MCC and head of the ruling cricket council at Lords, and MJK Smith, the Oxford-educated former captain of England. The antis were Peter Hayne, John Arlott, David Shepherd, the Bishop of Woolwich and former England batsman, and Dennis Brutus from the South African Non-Racial Olympic Committee. Their exchanges were refereed by Michael Charlton, while across the studio was a separate table with Robin Day overseeing party political response from Sir Peter Rawlinson for the Tories and Labour's Brian Walden. But the first voice came from an introductory interview with Colin Cowdery, another former England captain from Oxford who was in the twilight of his career. He presented a predictably emollient and non-confrontational argument for the tour to go ahead. We're all moving towards wanting multiracial sport all over the world. Um, but we're posed the question, how's the best and quickest, happiest way of achieving it? Is it through isolating ourselves from, this, from white South Africa, cutting off relations on this cricket issue? Or is it through maintaining the contacts and hoping to, to break it down slowly? I believe it's coming quicker than, quicker than we we're led to believe. I think the game itself is very solid on this matter, just judging by the county committees, county memberships and the various votes that are being taken at annual general meetings is all pretty solidly for the tour going forward. Much the same argument was put forward by Morris Allen from the MCC. And then John Arlott made his first intervention, accusing the cricket establishment of political myopia. They've settled this matter as if it were a matter that could be decided within cricket, when in fact it throws in peril the most dangerous situation that exists in Britain today, which is the question of the colour problem. If this is aggravated, as I fear this tour will aggravate it, then I am afraid we may have a similar situation to that which rules in America at the moment, and which is, has burst out in Trinidad. And all I would ask the other side of the table is this. Have they taken expert opinion about the probable effect of this tour on the colour situation in this country, which may settle the future of all of us and our children and the whole question of social life in this country. Have they considered it and have they taken serious advice? This was not a question that Wolf Wooler seemed to think worthy of an answer. What he wanted to do, it seems, was to score a cheap political point. The point I would like to make to John Arlott, if cricket did cease to play, He's very naive if he thinks this is the end. Now, these boys over here are after the guts of South Africa. Not just sport. They want to sink South Africa, Hayne and Brutus, and they will do it by any means in their power. The gross insensitivity of referring to two South African men, one of them, Dennis Brutus, coloured as boys, did not seem to have crossed his mind. But Peter Hayne ignored the insult and challenged Wolf Woolers and the MCC's version of events. 
What evidence have you had in the past 20 years to show that white South Africa, and we're talking about white South Africa, not South Africa, has moved towards multiracial cricket? The small glimmerings of a movement have been in the past two months, and those glimmerings have come not because of 20 years of appeasement and 20 years of smooth talk and bridge building, but because people were prepared to take a positive stand on this issue. At this point, the camera panned over to Robin Day, who wanted to know what his guests from the two main political parties thought of the possibility of the tour being disrupted by direct physical action. Sir Peter Rawlinson for the Tories argued that because it was inevitable that demonstrations would lead to violence, any incitement to demonstrate was illegal. To which Brian Walden responded by saying that the right to demonstrate was an important civil liberty that needed to be protected and that any possible violence could be avoided if the tour were called off. He expressed his astonishment that the senior administrators of English cricket were prepared to have any dealings at all with their counterparts in South Africa after being humiliated by them only two years previously when they refused to accept an English touring team that included the coloured Basil D'Oliveira. Then John Arlott entered the fray to voice his frustration at how those opposed to the tour were being misrepresented by those in favour of it. A very bad mistake has been made on the side of the people who are trying to preserve this tour, and it is this, that the objection to this tour is by a mob who are going to be violent. This is not true. I am no advocate of violence. I, just, I think he's dead just right. A, will you wait just a minute? The opposition to this tour is from the Labour Party entire, the Liberal Party entire, enlightened Conservatives like Sir Edward Boyle, the TUC, the Council of Churches, absolutely unanimous in asking the Cricket Council to call off the door. Which led Sir Peter Rawlinson to ask... Would you extend this principle against uh, banning uh, all tours and all teams from countries where there is tyranny and cruelty and infamous treatment to the citizens. But this was a question too far for John Arlott. Sir, I am sure you are a most eminent barrister. Do you always break the other party's line of argument with a completely specious and irrelevant interruption? At which point, before tempers frayed even further, Robin Day wrapped up the programme. The 1970 South African cricket tour was in the end called off and there's no doubt that John Arlott's involvement in the campaign led many to support the ban who might not otherwise have done so. But this was not the only fight against the English cricket establishment that he supported in the late 1960s and early 1970s. He came to us very early on and he came and said, whatever I can do for this organisation, tell me. He was very much regarded with affection and respect by all the authorities at Lords, And I think that actually allowed him entry where perhaps we would have found it much more difficult to get an audience. Peter Walker, who was born in Bristol but brought up in a politically radical family in South Africa, was a successful all-rounder for Glamorgan, who also played a handful of tests for England. And the organisation he says John Arlott offered to help was the Professional Cricketers' Association, a deeply controversial effort by county professionals to create a trade union to protect and further their interests. Peter Walker put himself forward as the representative for Glamorgan. My curiosity was because I was starting in the game, as you like, and it seemed to me to be a, a reasonable idea. When this was first mooted within the first-class game, what was the response of the players around the country? Scepticism. There were some, particularly the younger ones, who thought it was going to be a good idea because most of us were on about four or five quid a week at those times, uh, in all of the counties. Uh, but the older ones were too entrenched in the master-servant relationship. There was a big divide. It was totally out of kilter with what the TCCB, the Test and County Cricket Board, wanted in those days. Uh, and there was an immense battle to get them to appreciate and accept us. What did they say to you? The game is all right as it is. We don't want a player's revolt here. This is not a revolution. It's not like the French Revolution. Uh, You do really what we tell you is for the good of the game. And what you're trying to do here is destroy that. I didn't uh, feel anything other than, than... 
proud of what we were doing. Uh, we wanted our voice to be heard at Lords instead of being just told what to do. Uh, we actually would have an inject into how the game should develop. And somehow we needed to set up an organisation which would look after players who'd retired through injury. You weren't allowed to move counties in those days. Even then, remember, the registration rules was another issue we wanted to actually address. But if you went out of the game with an injury, the club waved you goodbye with a merry smile. Uh, we wanted some sort of recognition that they had an obligation. One way of summing all that up is that you want to be treated as grown-ups. Yeah, and as equals. In 1968, Peter Walker and his colleagues elected John Arlott as the first president of the Professional Cricketers Association. And not long afterwards, he explained to Helen Bamber on Woman's Hour what this meant to him. It did quite astound me that instead of picking one of their own, as I would have expected, perhaps an ex-England player or somebody like this, that they should have elected me. And this sort of makes me feel that I'm not really on the outside looking in, but that after these years I've just penetrated the door. It was a door that he had dreamed of opening ever since his boyhood in Basingstoke, when he had idolised the stalwarts of the Hampshire Eleven. And when asked on retiring what he would miss about his job, he just said, the company of cricketers. We raised the question earlier of what we can know of John Arlott if it's only his commentary that we know. Viewed one way, not all that much. Viewed another, everything, because he never left his politics at the door of the commentary box. He was, it seems fair to say, one of the great English radical liberals of the 20th century, and his courage was never to hide this, especially at the deeply conservative heart of the game he loved. <laughs> 